So I've worked with um, small and large software organizations in and around the Western Cape. And um, there's this real perception that Africa isn't competitive in the global sphere of software development, and that Africans won't make really good, great software programmers. And I actually know what you're thinking. Dude, you're not African. <laughs> uh, I am from the Philippines, and this magnificent body that you see here was engineered specifically to plant rice. Um, <laughs> but my parents, who were medical mission, missionary doctors, you can tell a doctor, by the way, they have a degree, um, they didn't want me to plant rice. In fact, they had a love of doing missionary work in, in Africa. And so we grew up in, my sisters and I grew up in very rural parts of, various rural parts of Africa. And my mom was extra clever. She discovered that Chinese people in South Africa in the apartheid years were honorary whites. So she got me into an all-white boys' school, which helped my education a lot. And I didn't have to stay in the States, and that was cheaper. Um, and thanks to the hard work of many people, including um, Trevor Noah, I'm now black empowered. Um, but you know, being other, um, has many advantages and disadvantages. It's very awkward when you're going to restaurants, going to restrooms, or dating girls. Not necessarily in that order, but it's, <laughs> it's generally very awkward. Um, what I did learn to appreciate while growing up here was that South Africa is diverse. It has an incredible amount of people, cultures, and it's just the, the greatest place to, to be. And so, like my parents, I believe in the continent, and I believe in in, in the future generation. So um, uh, about 10 years ago, I was asked to look at uh, resources, um, getting resources for a software project, went through CVs and interviews, and I asked this question, you know, why aren't there any more black programmers? And I asked my colleagues this, and they said, well, why don't you go to a historically black university, the University of the Western Cape, and find out? And I did that, but not as I'd intended. About the same time, my mom was, was battling cancer for about five years, and she decided to stop her chemo and live with us in Cape Town. And we, one of her wishes was that I go back and finish my BCom degree. And um, my family and I thought about it, and you know, we made a plan, and I went to UWC. A year later, um, I, I basically started lecturing after I graduated, and I started working with kids that were really introduced for the first time into technology. So I started this course um, to teach them how to program just by writing letters um, and introducing them into machine language. So if you, know, you made a stuff up, you know, it's no big deal, because if you send an email to somebody and they'd say, why the fail, you know, it's not a big deal. It's just an error message. So um, we do this now with the uh, Cape Peninsula University of Technology. Um, we have a center, a research center called Sankra the Center for CIO Research and the CIO Forum. And one of our key research areas is around skills development and how do you go from no income, no experience, to being a professional with like uh, three years experience and earning 15 to 20K, because that's what junior programmers earn. And it's really quite interesting. The main thing is that the big pathway we need to overcome is lack of experience. We for somehow decimated a whole structure of getting interns and apprenticeships and whatever else and we blame the universities, but in actual fact, it's industry's responsibility to create the professional. Um, so this is one of the things we're trying to bridge. And the other pathway is around mental models. And when I talk about mental models, we take for granted that we have circular plates, we deal with geometry all the time. And there are other kids from rural environments, poor communities, that haven't necessarily played with those building blocks. They haven't had that, that kind of experience. And I know that, because if I, didn't, if I didn't study, didn't go to kindergarten in California, didn't have the education that I have, uh, I might be planting rice. Um, so, and I also see the, 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 the benefit of actually getting kids to use that natural architecture, that sense of design, their creativity, if you can get it out of them, get them more confident, to actually start doing things in a structured way. So there's benefits of merging um, these, these worlds, but actually equipping people with the right mental models. So what you think is beautiful may be based on geometry and symmetry. What other people think is beautiful and aesthetically pleasing may be based on nature. The other pathway is towards more complex abstract thinking. 
Okay, so I don't know why we actually expect kids to have maths and science in order to program when it's the other way around. Geeks aren't smart because they work on, uh, the, because, or they don't go to Comic Con, go on vi videos, games, and so forth because they're smart. They're smart because they spend a lot of time doing that structured thinking uh, with computing. And software is really like uh, a language. It's a, it's a language to machines. And if we teach it like a language, we can actually help provide hooks for more complex uh, ideas dealing with numeracy and science. And so it should be the other way around. We should be teaching software programming in all schools as a language. Okay? So if anyone's in government and hears that, please think about it. Um, and the critical thing about this potential of building more software factories isn't, isn't about factories like, whoa, these are like guys that make iPods, um, you know, exploiting the youth. That's not, that's not it. It's about the industrialization, productionization of human intellectual capital. It's about creating divisions of labor so that we can get more people employed. So the last hundred years, we've been so preoccupied as a society, as humanity, to balance life between man and nature. The Germans had a lot of blame to that because they created wonderful things like the Bauhaus movement, which influenced art and architecture and modernism. But think about it for one second. In, the next, in this century, in the next centuries, wouldn't it be great if we could create problem solvers whose natural environment, nature, is a reference for new uh, solutions of design that can solve the world's problems not based on just balancing life between man and machine, but actually really thinking about the bigger problem of balancing life between man and nature. And we have such great indigenous knowledge systems. We have a reference model of nature all around us, and that is the one, most wonderful thing about Africa, is that we have these systems, many stories that we haven't yet told. If you look at just the film industry that's booming, it's, because it's booming because Africans want to tell their stories. The quality may not be great, but in the next couple of years, it will improve as people tell their stories. So we have to be patient with that. Um, I, for one, loved art and architecture. That's what I studied initially, and I wanted to be an artist, and I'm a failed artist. Okay, so a lot of you creatives can... can uh, I honor you. <laughs> um, but the one thing about um, this thing about modernism is that I, I really appreciated minimalism, stripping ornamentation out, just the function. And a lot of programmers, you know, we work with machines. So if we're not socially inept and we're not nice to you, it's because <laughs> we spend a lot of time dealing with taming just the machine. And um, at, at ac actually, at one stage, as a software architect and working with teams, I was really autocratic. I was really fascist. You did it my way or no way. And um, I'm probably still like that a little bit. But what changed? Well, when I was doing my thesis on building architecture as a reference for software-intensive systems, uh, I had friends that encouraged me to look at natural architecture, to look at agile methods like extreme programming. And so I expanded my literature review, and one day I was reading this book by Dave Pearson. And he was describing this Native American home that had three levels. And the third level was preserved for uh, basically people that had passed away, loved ones. And I sat in that library, and I was actually, it was, I must have been old, because we didn't have, I wasn't looking at the internet, and it was actually a real book. And, um, but I was looking at these great pictures, but suddenly I was motivated to build this house. And I understood the meaning, for me in any case, about balancing life between uh, man and nature. For me, I was still mourning my mom's death, and for me it was about the continuum of, continuum of life. It was about trying to preserve the things that they taught me. And I recall that my parents spent a lot of time actually investing in medical interns from all around the, the, the world. Um, European students would come to Africa because they could just basically do stuff that would take them many years to do if they did it in Europe. They couldn't operate, you know, they couldn't get into a room to operate on people. Um, and my, f my parents were very conscious of the fact that many of them would go back into very de developed environments, and they always inculcated this, this value system that to become a medical doctor, you actually, it was a calling. It wasn't a means to become wealthy, to buy your car, to your, your house, or, or um, your, your holiday home, which would have been great for us kids. And we kind of resented the fact that at times, you know, there were people in our houses that, that were 
called brothers and sisters that, that we didn't even know, and they would just bring them in. And I didn't appreciate that while, while my parents were alive. Being a parent now, I really appreciate what that means. For our young people to succeed, we need to change our mindset. They can't be A and C kids. They can't be DA kids. They can't be white kids. They can't be black kids. They are our kids. They're our future. We need to see them succeed. And to succeed, we need to protect them. We need to think about them. We need to think about the future. Um, we can't treat them as other people's children. My children are reared, uh, are parented from a diversity of, of friends and other people. And by investing in, in, in the next future in general, we're actually building uh, possibly a, a wonderful and, and really great place. So if you believe in this continent, you have to invest. You have to put in your skills. You have to share the knowledge that you have and invest in that. And this isn't just the talk. Um, I, I, I've kind of gotten frustrated with the pace of things. So I've, I've uh, asked to partner with the Chamber of Commerce and the Silicon Cape Initiative. And one of the things that we're going to be doing in October is trying to break a world record for the number of people that we train and mentor in a software skill in one week. And we're going to appeal to developers and people in the community to spend at least four hours to actually train people up in a software skill. It doesn't matter what the platform, technology, or languages will support it. And so it's really a way of trying to get people to understand that we can actually create that next generation of highly skilled Africans. And we're all Africans. So I am a second generation African. Like my parents, I live my life as such, and therefore I'm very proudly African.